You are listening to the questionnaire. Say that again. You're listening to the questionnaire. I've just started right here for your ears, for your eyes. The questionnaire. Get your comic on. Poke it out, poke it out, poke it out, poke it out. I say we grease this rep. Man. I mean, really. I want to check that. And I love that. I love that Scotty Young cover, but I'm trying to keep it nice and. You know, friendly over here, and that comic instantly had to start out like, you know, but I mean, it is the story that it is, telling what it is. I'm really interested to read that the rest of the way and see exactly what Marvel's done, but that's not what this is about, ladies and gentlemen. This is the questionnaire. I am the unknown factor, as always, and you know, we're gonna get into some things, get into some things. It's season two. I'm not even at this point sure what episode we're on in season two, and I don't even, and it's single digit, and that's terrible, but whatever. I hope y'all have been enjoying it. I mean, we had some great past guests. We got some great guests coming up. We've got so much going on. It is, it's, it hurts my head, rotating co-hosts, all this. But for this particular episode, you know, uh, Scott got sick, man. And then our guest was, like, exhausted, which is fine. You know, life happens. I get it. So we shifted it over a day, you know? But Scott had promised his boy that they were going to go see Dune. So, uh, or Dune too. So, and, you know, he's, he's kid's, like, I think 10 or 11, 12, somewhere around that. You know, when you promise the kid, you can't all of a sudden switch back. and said, see so, you know. But check it out. We got past interviews. I guarantee Scott's on 101. I know Scott's on one of them. He's Michael Oming. And then we got... Interviews coming up, but we'll have other co-hosts. Yeah, with that in mind, you should only be dealing with me as opposed to, you know, having some way more pleasant co-host here, Aletha Martinez in the house. Thank you for having me. Always. It's a pleasure. And in all sincerity, um, with having you on the PanCon before, which you are one of very few people who ever did a PanCon before they appeared on the show, but it's funny, within that PanCon, uh, uh, Shonda Ruff was also there, and she'll also be appearing on the show here in the near future. So I know that's the first time that's ever been a PanCon where two people were on a PanCon and then they came back later and did shows. So there is another Pan. Yeah, whatever. You ever do so much, it just blends together in your head? Yes, that's been my last week. <laughs> I would imagine just looking at like all of the things you've done and from from just there's a lot there's a lot there's there's a lot so we were kind of touching on some at least before we started the show and which was um if you're delving into a character how do you make sure you know the proper story per, uh, point in the story that you're telling because with especially when you're dealing with marvel or dc they do a lot of character switches at times to where a character might make a drastic shift one way or the other, right? And what you have to do when you're hired to write one of those to make sure that you're on point. What do you... I feel like that has to be one of the most dreadful part of your jobs. Just like, okay, here's a bunch of research on a character to make sure you're drawing it in the manner that it is at the moment. Well, it's like writers, I think... They tell you where we are. They all have this meeting before, and they they know where they are and their story and their continuity. We might not know exactly where they are in their story and continuity. I wait for the script for that. But beforehand, when they give me a character, it's like I think we all would have a built-in knowledge to how they should be, their countenance, and we start looking stuff up. I might not know their current costume. They might ask me to redesign that costume. If you tell me their city, well, then I'll start looking for things like that I could use for the city, meaning how has other people drawn this city? How does it appear in the book? Like if we're in Gotham, we know what Gotham should look like. Gotham should not have the Daily Planet standing in the background as Batman looks across the city. We know that would be like, oh, why did you do that? You're has insane. anyone ever done that? Huh? Has anyone ever? Okay. Okay, you just no. said that, and it made me think, is that occurred? <laughs> no, it, it that's that's part of what we do, that it does not occur. Yeah. So you know the city that you're in is like a character unto itself. So if they say we are a metro city, 
the okay, fine, we're gonna go look up Metro City stuff. If you tell me we're in Metropolis, I'm gonna go look up Metropolis. Say he's on his farm, well then we're gonna go look up farm stuff. We're gonna so we're gonna make sure the world matches. At least I can do that before the book begins and hope and pray that we're in the right location. And invariably, 80% of the time we are not in that location. It is someplace new. Here we are in space. I'm like, why are we in space? I didn't look at my space things. <laughs> But preparing for the character itself, themselves, like if they're, are they going to be in casual clothes? I don't know. Half the time, I don't know what they're going to wear, what they're going to deal with. But it's very funny. I must say, I have noticed something with writers. If it's a guy writing the book, I'm probably going to get standard fare, right? Regular, going to be in a superhero costume. We're going to have a fight. It's wonderful. If it's a lady drawing the book, I'm going to get something that I am totally too tomboyish to understand like let's go to this bridal shop and go look at gowns like, i've never done that in my life Ooh. they have stores like that that you just literally sit around shipping champagne and go find gowns on purpose so i have to look all this extra stuff up that i didn't even know existed <laughs> i <laughs> that was just that was just like yeah, they're going to a bra. I can't think of many comics I've ever read where they were in bridal shops for extended period of times. So I know they did that in. That's what some... They're called bridal shops. <laughs> I think, right? Oh my God. Okay, I I believe you. I will take that. I mean, look, I've watched chick flicks <laughs> with chicks, and you know, so I mean, on purpose. Big. I was with the female, so. Oh, I can't watch it's, it's, it's like. I can't. I mean, I'm not a fan either, to be real honest. Like, I mean, look, I the book I just had when when they told me they were doing that what if for for if that character survived in the Alien series, I was like, mm -hmm. yes, because I can't tell you how many times I've watched that movie and when that character dies, I went, yes. <laughs> I nearly picked up the um, you know, the Bishop novel. There's a new there's a book called Bishop because I like reading the alien series. Oh. So I don't read Godzilla, but I will read the aliens. And they've had some great books, but then they've had some seriously bad books. I mean painfully bad. But now there's one out on Bishop, and I'm like, oh, I might have to buy this book no matter what. And it's taking place between, you know, aliens two and three. So so it's literally following continuity of movies. So you have aliens two, aliens three this book i'm like ooh, <laughs> intrigued right now you're gonna go get it too yeah yeah i'll definitely be picked because i mean the aliens is like i'm looking forward to seeing what they're doing with aliens romulus based on the fact that it's between alien and aliens love i cannot wait to fall in love i watch all the movies and I still watch it because of the sets, because they build everything. And obviously he likes to jump scare people even now. That's his thing. But just that whole world building, even though the story was silly. I mean, I laugh out loud during Covenant when the little alien blew up the ship and ran off. I laughed out loud hard. It was like this one little creature and you blew up your whole ship. <laughs> and here he goes running away. I'm like, this is perfect. But I love it. I watch them endlessly. I love that world. So yeah, and I read it. So yep. All right, then then man, we're we're gonna get real real off topic here because you brought that because I got that up. And now we're into this and now yeah because I've read a lot of Alien and Predator books from back from when they were in Dark Horse and then I don't know who the publishing company was when it was an actual book book, but I read a lot. I mean, I read the graphic and the book versions of a lot of the alien predator uh, stuff, especially the first two, because the first two, yeah, the first two, which they put out in book and graphic novel, I had them and I probably read the comic three or four times. I've also uh, had a pleasure of Mark Verheiden being on the show. Who's responsible for a good chunk of alien and predator work that was done really, really early on. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah they, they were connected at first for a long time. I remember when that first comic book came out and I read that one. And then I'm like, you know, I like my Predator to be separate because Predator 1, one of the best movies I've ever seen. I love that movie so much. Love it. That is my movie. And then but Aliens is like, this is my special universe. I don't want them to be together. Hmm. Really? I, I always thought, well, you've seen Prey, right? 
Of course. Okay. Oh, that's good. I hear there's going to be a second prey. I seen something about that recently, and I'm very, very because because I that is definitely I, I in in the series of Predator films. Like I don't know what I'd put first if it would be the first Predator or if it would be Prey. I know that they would definitely be right here with one another long before. And even though I love, I love Predator 2, I think Predator 2 is very, very underrated. I think it was very well done as far as throwing them in the city like that. But there are some yeah. Predator films that are kind of questionable in my opinion. Um, but no, when they, when they threw them together in the comics, I thought it was genius how they did it. Because if you think about, I mean, it was, it was really well put together. I, yes, I just, I, I wish they could have done the film not on Earth in the year 2006. Yeah, I wish that too. But then I guess they were new with their in their thought process of this whole thing. It was interesting, and I think that's why it made it a more of a standout movie than the others, where you you have people being abducted and taken other places, which seems within character. But when it was in the Arctic, it felt too much like, you know, Maze Runner, something very contained and isolated not like some not like aliens who've been running around and doing this forever because they have been running around so why would they care about our society or where they decide to attack us it seems they would want to hunt in the urban jungle just to see if they could yeah yeah i think well that's why i like how they explained it in the comics though or at least the 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 first comic in the first book that it and i mean they did it in the movie too you know it's a rite of passage for a young hunter to go mm-hmm. and, like you kill your first alien. That's a hey. You, you killed the meanest thing on the planet, dude. Kudos. You know, let me let me dip some acid on your forehead. I always thought that was so rude. Um <laughs> I mean, really, right? Like, like you accomplished it. Now come here, let me scar you for life with this thing's finger. Oh my god. Right? That's I what like, they did. did like- I remember seeing in one comic where they actually, like, I remember one of the alien and predators I did read, and I think it's one of the first ones, where they're transporting the eggs or the queen. And I'm like, that makes so much sense. That's, it does make sense. They would hunt this thing because, yeah. <laughs> and that's what, that's what, uh, so wait, so you've never read the, like, the first alien versus predator comic? I think I read the very first one when it came out as a volume, but then I stopped because, as I said, I didn't really enjoy the marrying of the two worlds fully. But there are times when it does happen, and I'll say, okay, I've got to read it. So I do remember distinctly seeing a drawing of inside of a pred- predator ship, and they're transporting the aliens. Like, I guess they were eggs or maybe the queen yeah. to to no. deposit them to hunt. Well, that's because they... I'm I'm gonna get really nerdy into Alien vs Predator here for a minute because that's, oh, that's let's go, let's go. yeah that's that's my jam I love it I love the other I won't even lie um, they would take eggs and they would drop them on a planet like a random planet and then they would you know have some aliens pop out and then they would take us a, a group of predators there'd be like six seven ones that were um what are they I don't un something they called them un something like they were un you know like they never killed an alien is what it boiled down to though. And then there would be two others that were, huh? Yeah, yeah. They were virgins. Yeah, pretty much. Two others that were pretty hardcore, and then one other that was like, "Look, I will kill a queen with a spear and nothing else, and I will do it." You know, and so it was like a little squad of like, "Here, okay, here's this real just predator that is above and beyond. Here's two predators that are, <laughs> you don't really want to go mess with them." And then here's a bunch of idiots, right? And we're going to go see if they can handle these. And I think it was an interesting way to show that it was more of a society within the Predator. And they were really ostensibly just trying to train people to hunt in the craziest manner of freaking anything. It was just when they did that, it was a planet they'd used previously because they always made sure they cleared the hive before they left the planet because they know what that thing is. So Mm -hmm. they're like, no, we go make sure the queen and everyone's dead because we don't need to leave this crap this land. But they're... A colony had recently started on that planet, and that's why everything went really, really badly. Because suddenly there were humans in the mix, and they're doing stupid human things that make it to where the hunt isn't going like every other hunt before it had. So yeah, it just it just got bad. And the lead female character in that in that book and the uh, next book, AVP War. I mean, the way they 
turned her. It was, no, I can't believe you didn't. That surprises me. Oh, now, see, but you're intriguing me. The way you said it, it's like, oh, no, now I think I have to go and read this thing. Oh, I have to go and incorporate it, something that I literally stayed <laughs> away from just because I didn't like the blending of the worlds. It was like, now I have to because he explained it so wonderfully that I need to read it. Well, and then if you read the second book, which is AVP War, and I'm, I'm sorry, you're going to, you're going to, I, I don't know that Marvel has reprinted these. I don't know how easy they would even be able to get a hold of now based on the fact that, you know, Dark Horse lost the rights to all of this. Like, I wish I had my collection of Dark Horse graphic novels that I used to, that I will have to hunt eBay to ever get again or find them just like you. Like, you ain't going to find them new anymore because um, it was kind of ridiculous. But yeah, and then because they weave that same story right to where I don't want to give any details. You should, I, I highly recommend the book. It's I like, do. I'm pretty certain I'll probably be able to find it in an omnibus while you're talking. I'm going, yes, let me go and look right now and see if they have put it together and I can buy it from Amazon so I can enjoy it. And I'm pre it must be within this giant 400 page book. So Thanks. I will buy this and enjoy it. And like, oh, is no, it Alien versus Predator? They got an Alien versus Predator omnibus? Yeah, they do. Now, I have to be careful. Some of them have are, um, prose books and some of them are are uh, graphic novels, but this one looks like it's a prose because I read them too. I love the no. whole tie and make it make it make sense to me. But I'm going to look for the one you said, Alien well, versus Predator. Now, let me point out the very first Alien Predator book and the and the second one follow the exact same story as the graphic novel. Like because I've read uh -huh. the book and the graphic novel, they are the same story as far as in the telling of them. You know what I mean? It's just you get the comic book form in one and you get the book in the other. So they they served them up on two separate platters so they were available to everybody. I think that was wise for them to do that in the aspect of how well known both of those characters are. That's probably why they did it marketing wise. I mean, it really makes sense now that I think about it. Um, you know, they made but I mean, I had copies of both like the first two books. I had the books and the graphic novels because um, like, I mean, they were just. They were, they were good. It's some of the, in my opinion, it's some of the best alien and best predator stuff. Really? really? So I'm going to get the alien versus predator in the, in the um, prose form because I want to read everything that they missed. And I don't want to have to struggle through somebody else's storytelling to get to what the author meant to say. I, you know, I don't know how that was done. If it was a graphic and then converted into a book or if it was a book and then converted into a graphic, to be real honest. I remember, look, I remember buying this stuff at Walden's bookstore, which, <laughs> yeah, go ahead and <laughs> laugh at me. Mm. Oh, don't worry, we'll be laughing about Barnes and Noble soon. Oh, no, and I love Barnes and Nobles. <sighs> Whatever, I miss Walden books, man. It's annoying. <laughs> I the other one, Borders books. I miss that one so much. God. Wait, didn't... Oh, no, that's what took over Walden Books in the local mall here for a little while before people just don't read enough. It's sad. It they, really is. Borders in, in New York set up these beautiful reading areas so people would come in and read like a library and just sit there all day reading one book after another and buy nothing. And it was beautiful. I mean, they had two, they had, unfortunately, the one location that was in the World Trade Center, used to go there all the time. And then they had one at 59th Street. And I'm telling you, you could sit there and just read and read and read. And that's what people would do. Sit there in chairs, reading until they fall asleep, wake up and keep reading. And yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's good. I wish there were more places like that. I mean, for real, there's very few places in the society we live where you can exist for free in any capacity, except, you know, a library <laughs> well they were taking it for a library but you could see how that as a business model they should have at least yeah. required you to buy one drink or one something if you're going to come in here and read for until from sun up to sundown because we used to go and there used to be regulars that you could see you're like yep yeah, there they are they're here at this time sleeping in the chair because you've been here reading for hours it's like at least require them to buy one book yeah yeah like look man if you're in here for 10 hours, it's a one book minimum. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That'd be, really, that'd be just really weird to hear. It's like, you know, I've heard of one drink minimum, but what, what, one book minimum? 
Yes, one book minimum. And I would literally buy the one book just because it was such an experience. They used to do a lot of like author readings and all that kind of stuff. They used to bring people in. It's like, this was great. And then they were gone. Now Barnes and Nobles does something of the same, but I've noticed they've abbreviated their sitting areas quite a lot. Well, and I don't know about like Barnes and Noble in general, but the ones up here or the one that is in the town that I live in, man, they, when it comes to comics. Yeah, actually, they're, they come and go like if I want to find something obscure, I there's two Barnes and Nobles in, in New York City, Manhattan, where I live, that you can go to and they will be sitting on the shelf. They expanded one. Till I noticed that Kinokuniya, the Japanese bookstore that's here, that you would go like, okay, they're going to get the manga first. No, Barnes & Nobles was getting it a week before them. And I'm like, oh, so we go to the one at 84th Street because they're going to stock earlier than even the comic book stores and, and the um, Japanese bookstores. So I was like, this is amazing. So they're trying something. I hope they stay around. Let me retract my statement real quickly, though. It's Books a Million here, not Barnes & Noble. Uh it's their collection. It's their selection of graphic novels that is very, it's very, very poor, and mm -hmm. very, and very much the kind of graphic novel selection to where, even if you were just walking in just looking for a comic to read, you know, I, I think it would if if that's the collection of comics you see that they have, like, and I'd never read a comic, I'd probably look and be like, I'm good, and walk away, right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, just sincerely, because it's not, it's not well organized, it's not well put together, there's not, like, look, I feel like as a bookstore, if you're trying to attract people to read comics in any capacity, there's certain things that you should keep in stock, especially with, <clears throat> pardon me, especially with the, the films that have currently played out, you know what I mean? Like, like, if you don't have Civil War in stock in the graphic novel form, like, I don't know why that, that wouldn't be a big seller based on the MCU. Just certain things like that. And it's and then hopefully, you know, keep some smaller books as well. Like, I could sit here, I could list a billion graphic novels I think should be in all bookstores. But that means that they would have to acknowledge them truly as a piece of literature. And the fact that, you know, they promote reading in a lot of ways. Um, they do. Why do you think, and we've gotten to this in past shows, but I want to know, because you've, you've been in the industry for quite some time. You've worked on some really big books. You've got your own book coming out. Why do you think it is that comics are still viewed to a certain degree the way they have been for so long, just as funny books? But clearly they're not. They ain't all funny. Now, see, that now you're asking an age-old question, something that's from before our time entirely. It's how society views this kind of stuff and what it was for, the purpose of it. They, like, I remember the only cartoon that, and Kurosawa we could watch was Pedro Pica Pedra, which is um, Fred Flintstone. And my grandmother said that was too adult, so you go play in the yard. So we weren't allowed to watch that. So it's like, that was the one thing we could watch on TV aside from this stop motion Pinocchio that was really violent in every other episode. I was very surprised to come here and see how dumbed down things were for the American public to consume, especially kids, going at this was an adult cartoon. Once I guess their comics code or whatever got a hold of it, and usually it's those crazy Christians because they're the ones that took He-Man from us because some child said that He-Man was the master of the universe. Thank you so much. But it's very weird. What you're left with is this super sanitized, super like uninteresting, devoid and stripped of everything cartoon so no wonder you don't get any respect because when people now think of that stuff, it's now divorced from the things that would be interesting to an adult audience. And immediately all of our elders say they're nothing but funny books because they made it like that. They're, they are the generation that was, that was snatched, all this stuff was snatched from them by the older ones who are dead and gone. So now they don't have a good thought toward this stuff. It's like, I wouldn't read that. I'd go do anything else. I'll go paint the house before I read a comic book. So we, it doesn't have a good thing. There's not a good thought to it. And now we have a kind of, I hate to say this because I need everyone to buy the books, but our population is aging. We want books certain ways. 
So now we're getting, we are in internal struggle, a sort of civil war, because the books are becoming more diverse. They're starting to be more inclusive and they are without memory to what it was before. So it's like, why do we have to have all this diversity and all this stuff like that? It's like, well, look who found the comic books. I'm pretty certain they didn't have certain demographics in mind. In fact, they kind of just wanted to tell stories. It's a pure form of storytelling. And I kind of wonder, think about it, we divert back to the older tales, more so than the ones that are that feel forced to us. But as we evolve and have to bring in new re readership, you have to now present this golden ticket of comics to be more inclusive of our world. So we are, in other words, we're growing still. So it's hard to answer that question straight because we're in growth pains. That's so intriguing. And I want to touch on about 30 things you just said. Not really, it's only three. <laughs> um, what, do you really think the comic book code had that much of an effect on creating the whole opinion that comics were just funny books, like truly? Yes, because think about think about what the reader would see. What would you go into? You went to pick up a comic book and it was one way one day. And now the next day, they're still putting out a comic book and they've stripped it of everything that you thought was interesting. Are you gonna buy that book? Now you grow up and your kids wanna buy comics. Your opinion of comics was formulated when? Why would they care? It, why would you care? Those are for kids. Those are not even, I was a kid when that came out. I, would, I didn't even wanna read it. Why would I wanna read it now? They don't see it. And when you have a society that says that is not important, art is not important even though a civilization is remembered by their art. If you go visit King Tut's tomb, it's not, you're not gonna go and see, oh, look at all the policies that were written down on these tablets and the past, but you know, all this ancient paper. No, you're gonna go see his, the art, all what the artisans have done. We are remembered by our art, but notice that is the one thing that they've tried so hard to control and sanitize, and it keeps going through these bursts of, let's just, scorch the earth of all this kind of stuff. Now you've got people like comics eating all the, let's scorch the earth of all this diversity. You're trying it again and again and again. So we're constantly growing and it looks, imagine to someone who doesn't read this, what does this look like? Well, well and you make a valid, yeah, you make a valid point. If you look at almost any great civilization that's fallen and we have their art, it's mainly their art we focus on, not not the things that they accomplished as a civilization. Like, I don't think, I think people probably think of you know, Greek artists before they think of the fact that, yeah, that's why you have indoor plumbing. You know what I mean? Which they, exactly. they, they both came from that era. Many a great artists did, but I mean, you're right. That's what civilizations are remembered for. But I do think it's odd because, because you make a valid point in the fact that comics were pretty much started by white men. I mean, if you look at all the great characters that are considered like icons nowadays, and you look back who created them, um, I don't think you're going to see much diversity. I'd really, really have, because I'm sitting here trying to run through just like, you know, the top guys from the two big, the big two. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, they're all white. Um, uh, but I don't understand in going forward as a society where we are, why we wouldn't understand that one comics are for everyone. So, and especially especially if you look at it in the case of of Marvel, because Marvel is based in our world. Why would the ratios not be equal to our world? For it not to be doesn't make any logical sense, and it also misrepresents everything that you'll see growing up if you're not seeing that within those books. I think to show that in those books will give people a far broader view of what the world truly is at a younger age, which I think is a great thing. I don't understand why there's a misconception about that. I mean, firstly, before you answer, right, I I understand why people have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to look for something. Well, you might as well say, say because I thought what you were thinking too, that it did not exist before then. Then I realized there were things like all Negro comics. And that there were comic book artists. The one that changed, and I, I actually bought his book recently. I can't find it, and it's not like near me. It would be in my library, so I'm actually looking for it. This was an artist that drew in that style, 
that we would easily recognize and it's coming between that Dick Tracy when they're now folding into comic books and it's serious. And I'm telling you, when they say serious comics, you would say that this is what Kirby and he there this is their contemporary. So why wasn't this guy working for the big two? And that's when that's a question I don't want answered because I fear that it's going to be something I don't want to hear or learn about iconic people that I have that I have literally looked up to their work and go and you hold them as basically our comic book saints. There are certain aspects about why certain artists were excluded at that time that might have to do with something that we don't want to discuss. Yeah, and I mean, it's because, I mean, we can discuss it because it's terrible, it's part of history, but it's just unfortunate. Um, but as far as what you said, that's like um, on the set, the dark side of kids' TV. Have you heard of this show? Yeah. Oh my okay. goodness, when Look, I saw that, I, I'm okay. like, Okay, okay, okay. I never want the comic book version. I never want the comic book version. Let yeah. me say once again, I never want the comic book version ever. Never. You are so right about that. I don't want the comic book version. And it's so weird because I feel that even if we, even if I find this book and I show it to you and you see the time frame, this is back in the 50s and these earlier times, with um, the People are existing in the same space, but you didn't ask this artist to draw for Marvel when they are clearly one of the best I've seen, period, from that time. I'm, I, I something hurts. Something's I, like, oh. I know that that particular, because it was a company, right? There was, I don't know. There was a company or something. I'm looking for I'm, it now. I'm pretty sure it was a company. Um, and yeah, with all these comics, they yeah. had several, and I guess they, for whatever reason they couldn't survive, I guess readership, you have to think as again, society drives these kind of things. The, it drives it now. So when it's like, well, this book was here, but it didn't last. It's so weird. Like Nubia lasted two, two volumes and then she gets, you know, relegated to a role of a politician basically, which is usually what happens to characters of color when they come out and you don't want to shelf them entirely. But I have people who are like, oh, I'm such a big fan. I'm your supporter and all that stuff, but you don't buy the book. Oh, I don't buy books like that. I'm like, well, don't be surprised when they don't. And well, they don't publish or, or stick with the diverse books. Number one, you've got a problem when thinking it's a diverse book. The main, It's a superhero title like any other. Read the book for what it is. Secondly, you don't, what is a book like that? What does that mean? So automatically you've got a sort of prejudice built into what people absorb prejudice that's born from unfortunately the way our society is set up right now that we are struggling with growing pain struggling with them you would think i would think we've gotten past this point and then i just noted the code words change it's no longer oh you draw like a you know, who you don't draw like a girl now it's what makes you interested in this? Like, like you almost have no right to be in this space and they're just finding different ways to say it. See, and it's funny because I think that exact stigma really hurt one of Marvel's, uh, and I mean the MCU's, uh, recent releases. That was a that was a phenomenal film because I, I can't say I haven't. I've watched pretty much everything Marvel's put out um, as far as the films. Uh, there's, there's a couple that I look at and I was like, yeah, really just... I wasn't a fan of, you know, and in all honesty, <laughs> um, like, I think, I think the ones that have gotten panned the most because in the past year were, uh, the Eternals, Ant-Man and the Marvels, right? Like they yeah. got really, 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 really bad. Like people were saying they were terrible. Look, the Eternals, I, I, I mean, it was okay, but I think it suffered the same thing that the Justice League film did. You're trying to set up this huge team way too quickly, and it's it's just you ain't taking the time you need because you don't have it, and that's I think that film suffered a lot for that. The Ant Man, the Quantum Minium, you had to have seen like a good four other films and watched Loki to truly enjoy all of that film. That was see that. right there, yeah. right there. What you're saying, I love all the Marvel films, but. You're going to put me through a volume two, and I'm not too sure I can survive it to see the end. You're taking too long. 14 years? My child grew up. 
and he's supposed to be taking, I mean, he's going to take me and my grandchildren to go see these, the, the, well, you know, the next Avenger architect, and then you're making me do homework. You're forcing me to watch things I have no interest in just to understand, as with, like you said, the Marvels. So I did not want to see Ms. Marvel. She's of a younger group and is wonderful and cutesy and funny. I don't enjoy a lot of comedy. I like sci-fi and horror for the most part. So when I see this forced humor or when you don't take your own drama seriously so you make a joke out of it, I'm a comic book artist. I like serious drama. I like epic tales. I don't want you making a joke just before we go into battle because then no one takes the battle seriously. But I had to have read this to even understand, number one, why does Camilla have those bracelets? How did she get those bracelets? Why are those bracelets important? What did Ms. Marvel do to, you know, what did Captain Marvel do to upset a whole planet? I didn't do enough homework going in, so I could not, you pushed me out of the movie. So I was just sitting there watching it going, mm, this was half a movie. You know, I never thought about how much the Marvel's film suffered from that exact same plot point. Cause look, like I, the Miss Marvel show. Yeah. I, I wasn't a fan of either. I agree. It was, it was for, but it, again, I'd like to, they made that for a younger great. audience, which is yeah, fun. It was great. That's Love awesome. it. That, mm-hmm. You know, but I, I personally, it, it wasn't my cup of tea, you know, uh, but the Marvel's film, I mean, I enjoyed the Marvel's film very much. So no, mind you, I, skimmed through enough of the Miss Marvel show. Didn't really watch it, but, you know, sometimes, like, had it play in the background or was like, you know, I'm going to watch the last five minutes and stuff because I know how the MCU runs just from years of reading comics. You know, it's... They're they're trying to do in film what they do with their comics, which is crazy because if you look at, like, how many comics the actual Civil War is, like, the actual... I mean, it's a good, probably, stack like that if you wanted everything all the tie-ins all of that same with like the age of apocalypse or there's so many stories that are huge like that so from just reading comics as long as i have i'm aware of that that's why i made sure i knew enough about the character to where when she popped up again i was like oh well that explains x y and z uh but overall i do think it was at least way better than the eternals i think it's funny that the film that suffered the most if you look at is the one that they, there is no, here are these characters, here's this, this is all new, but did it work? No, they didn't take time to introduce these characters to anybody, because we've known them as, and even as so, by the time you've taken them out of their world, you're not explaining their world in the first place, you explain nothing, and I think that's the problem with modern storytelling, it's less show and more tell. They want to figure out how to tell you the entire thing in five minutes, the first five minutes. And then you walk through and you, didn't you enjoy it? But they're not telling you anything. You didn't world build for me. You didn't allow me. You've got to let me know the characters to care about these characters, because if I don't know them, I don't care what happens to them. It's very strange that even when I'm reading, a, I'm in a lot of groups where we date and read books. And invariably, when it's time to review and everyone's coming together, they the long form, the things that you know you're going in for something Game of Thrones long, right? Well, because you didn't tell them everything in the first three paragraphs, they're going to pan the book. Oh, I didn't like it because it just seemed like there'd be a lot to read. I heard that once. I'm like, what? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, fine. There's a lot to read. You're not hearing it all in the first paragraph. It's like there was, you were describing the world to me. So you wanted a book report, you wanted cliff notes of this book. So if you're going to do cliff note movies, of course people are not going to want to watch that. They're going to be like, okay, I don't understand where we are. <laughs> Firstly, Game of Thrones is a great series, but oh my God, those books are really thick. I will say that. I've read everything. In this, I, I couldn't read the the one that's written literally like a history book. You know the one I'm talking about? Yeah, like I read the first one. And because I love, like, I respect J.R.R. Martin because he can handle huge casts of characters and make you care about everyone. So when I read books, I read not just for the story, but for the structure of it to see how they handle, how did this author approach this work? How did they deal with this? And then if you ask me as from a standpoint of a creator wanting to learn and 
absorb what another person is doing and says, how did you handle this massive cast and make us care about everybody and keep it running? Wonderful book. Uh, for Aletha, the person who reads it, this is not a book for me. I did not read any further than the first one. Because uh, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I know the story, but the moment I have to deal with twin cest and murdering kids and all kind of weird stuff, I'm like, I'm done. We're done. I'm not sticking around here for this. So when they started watching it, and then I knew one thing too. He's not going to finish this book. I noticed the attention span is short for projects. When he's out there helping them, letting people borrow his DeLorean so they could dig up E.T. old cassettes from the desert in Mexico, we've got a in New Mexico, we've got a problem. So I'm like, he's not going to finish this. So when people started watching this show, and then they get angry at the end, I'm like, they had to figure something out because he's busy playing with his DeLorean and moving well, on to other things that he will you, halfway finish. Yeah, you know, you know the uh, the showrunners, the guys that ended up taking and doing the show. Uh, George R. R. Martin said the only reason he let them do it is because they'd figured out the ending that he was going to go with. Yes, but he should have written the ending. Okay, look, <laughs> as a man that has read. Because I read all of those books as far as the uh, the Fire and Ice story. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I read the Game of Thrones, the, you know, everything. Like, I, I read all of it up to the, I don't remember what the last book was, to be real honest. I, I, I don't think I have them anymore. But I hadn't had them all at a point, and I've read them all up to what is supposed to be the last book, which I agree with you. I don't think, if it ever comes to fruition, I'll be bloody amazed. Like... <laughs> I, 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 I will, I'll go and I'll get it and I'll fully read it. Even, even if it's going to end the same way as the series, I want to see how it's handled because they, I mean, they couldn't include everything that was in those books. The the show would have been twice as long. That's my, like when you get these kind of things, it's like, I know this book came before the story. There's so much more to tell. There's so much more they cannot tell. They cannot sit down and slow down a show for everything you can read in a book. So I'm like, finish this for us, please. You're killing people. Come on. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I don't get why people complained about it so much, too. It's like you realize that technically just reflects society. Like, literally, hey, look, everything went to crap. People all started fighting. People switched sides a bunch. Blah, 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 blah. And then we pretty much just went back to what the status quo was. Yeah, and then really, if you look at it, he's pulling from a lot of historical events, things that I guess to people that seem like, oh, my God, it's new. If it No, this is, you know, you had, he had lots of great teachers, Richard de Longshanks, what was going on over in the, in, on, on the other side of the pond at that time. Come now. They had lots and lots and lots of people that he could pull from who did some really messed up things historically. So when it's so weird that, these things seem new to people. They seem so new because I don't I, think we read enough, period. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, well, and I and I will say, I'm pretty sure um, the Lannisters represent a pretty historical family that still exists, and I'm not going to say anything else. Again, yes, because, we're going to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, yeah, we, 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 all, we all know who we're talking about. Either, yeah. If you know, you know, and we ain't going to know no more because I ain't trying to have this not be my hand, you know, um, at my neck. So, <laughs> you know, so I mean, it, it was, it was very historical. I, I, it, it drives me, I don't understand how people don't get that. I feel like there's a lot of people, and I think like, like that's a common misconception with comics. I think people go in, and I think people will sometimes even pick up a book and thumb through a little bit of it, and they'll be like, oh, this is just a funny book. And it's like, well... You obviously aren't really taking into context everything that's going on, even just being able to look at the art and understand it as part of the story. Why do you think we, I mean, I feel like we've lost part of, now I'll tell you what I think it is. I think it's TikTok personally. And just, it's, it's everybody, it's, it's, it must be instantaneous or it's not going to be worth it. And for everyone out there, I want to let you know, sure, you can get a quick little, a dopamine right to your head by that quick fix, right? You you can. It's easy. It's simple. It's it's available everywhere on this planet. You don't even need drugs. All you need is your phone to get a quick hit of dopamine. Whether you want to play a game, scroll, whatever, whatever. There's a ton of things you can scroll, a ton of things you can do. You go play freaking 
Oh, the the stupid fruit matching game, whatever it's called, Candy Crush. There you go. See, I don't do these things. Um, I'm not. I'm a. I, I scroll so little. It's probably bad for the show. Uh, <laughs> that's a fact. But I, I think that's caused a lot of the problem. But people need to realize that if you really put something into it, whether mm-hmm. it's if it's just something you enjoy, then that hit. It's different and it's better. You know what I mean? That's, that's weird that you say that because that's exactly what I was saying, how they want things so instantaneous that they want the whole story in the first paragraph. But then if you give them something like that, they don't like it because it lacks history and it doesn't feel full and complete. So you can't have it both ways. The, and if you think about it, they keep retelling and relaunching the same storylines. You're not telling me anything else, anything new. You're not letting me come forward in the history of these books. And I think it's literally because it became disposable and this origin stories are not disposable. These are the ones that are stronger because they took their time. This is when you could add to the universe without destroying it or worrying about continuity. So I'm sure that the if you're going way back when comic books were first created, there was a much more of a freedom and freewheeling. We're going to create a new villain this week, and this is what's going to happen. And we're going to wrap the story in this one book. You're not going to have to read the next 20 books and then go get 20 more books and cross over to this other title that's not doing so well. So we want you to read that too. And let's, and now I'm going to get some variant covers in here for you, for those old time collectors who really, really, really want to go around and cheat, scam people out of, you know, Go to con- I, I realized I was this many years old when they bring you up those graded books. You're supposed to charge for that signature. <laughs> I, I would not. I'm like, I'm happy to sign what people put in front of me. You know, I'm happy you support the book. But there's a whole industry going on underneath. They would send you in the comp boxes these books that have no, no price tag on it. And like, So I was selling them for... You know, when I sell off my comps, I don't keep a lot of books around my house like that. I've sold them for cover price or maybe a dollar more on there. And they're like laughing. So it just all of a sudden my kid was at a con this year and I wasn't at the table. So he looked up the price, what this book should cost. The raw book unsigned was over $100. And I'm going, like, I feel so cheated, so violated. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, and I mean, I never thought about that. I mean, this is a discussion with, uh, in the last season of episode one, we we had Alfonso on. And it was it was a pleasure. And we discussed the fact that for some, for some reason, there's a portion of people that get comics and don't even read them. Mm-hmm. Don't with- want to crack the spine. Like, look, I, I'm not going to lie. There are times where I bought variant covers. I bought the variant cover because I thought the variant cover looked cool. And, and like, and you know, there's like six of them. And I'm like, oh, well, those two are really cool. And I just I just really want those two. So I'm just going to get those two. I still bloody well read the comic. I mean, and I didn't really even care which cover I read, particularly, because it was all more about the story than yeah. anything else. Why, why do you think... There was such a switch, and I've had this discussion with past people. I just want to uh, hear your opinion on this, Aletha. I really, really do. Um, why do you think there was such a switch in the comic market? As opposed to, like, if you look at books. Sure, there are books that are collectible. But nobody went out and... I mean, a bunch of people went out and bought Game of Thrones. Like, every time a new book came out... They'd go and they buy that hardcover edition. I'm pretty sure they weren't being like, oh, I got to have the first edition and I'm going to be sitting up on a shelf and, you know, in, in, you know, three or four weeks or like some absurd amount of time, which was probably either way too short or way too long. It'll be worth a ton of money and I can flip it. In comics, that happens ridiculously. I mean, you to look at the Ultimate Spider Man number one that just came out. Like it, sold ridiculously. I think it sold way more than they expected it to, to be real honest. I wish it, I had it on my pool just for the story, not for the cover price, not for what it's going for. I want to point out, but just from what me and Dave discussed as far as the story and Spider-Man's the character that really initially got me into comics. Um, why do you think 
there was just that twist. Like, why did it become so much of where the companies were pushing it as a collectible, as opposed to them being like, hey, look at this really oh. cool story. <laughs> I love it. Your baby started howling right then. That was a yeah. perfect time. My He's dog like, was like, hey, I agree. Read the story. Exactly. It's like, this is exactly my thoughts, Dad. This is what I was thinking, too. Why did this happen? Well, then this comes back to my personal origin story with comics. Some people have read comics their entire life. I did not. So I didn't even know they existed till I first saw an ash can. I knew I wanted to tell stories. I had no idea that it was an art form, that there were books, that there were comics, there were the things until a missionary brought an ash can, you know, one of those little half size books. And it was a Spider-Man comic. And I'm sitting in my class in Curacao and I'm looking at this thing and it's like somebody just, you know, when someone hands you something and it just makes your heart beat fast, my heart is pounding and I'm able to read it because I can read English. So I'm looking at this thing and it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. You know, an amazing Spider-Man adventures. And I could practically hear Stan Lee's voice. I didn't know who he was then, but I could, you know, do the voiceover later in life. And it's just a small book that they didn't let me keep. They took it and left with it. And I'm going, where is this from? Where did this come from? What is this thing? So it was years and years and years later when I'm in America now, I'm a, you know, a tweenie and I'm going to the, they tell me to go inside and pay for gas at the 7-Eleven in Florida. And I look there and there's X-Men and Jim Lee is drawing it. There's a Wolverine on the cover. I didn't know who this character was at the time. And I wanted this book so badly that I nearly took the book and gave him the gas. But now I, I know I'd get, you know, my head cracked open and that's where they'd find my body. So I did not buy this book with the gas money that you're supposed to pay it, pump for. But I asked for it, and the attitude was, that's pachingo. So funny books, that's just the, that's just the Hispanic words. Where that's, that's clown work. That's clownish. All We're right. not having that. So that's junk. So I wasn't allowed to have this book, but I saw it. So what I would do is walk back up to the 7-Eleven, two and a half miles from my house, Ooh. just look at all these wonderful, colorful things. Then I decided, how can I get these things for myself? So I have to go cut lawns, mow lawns. So I went and mowed lawns so I can get $10 to come up and buy a book. And back then, $10 will get you a couple of books. Not like now, $10, I might get one or two books. Back yeah. then, I can get like five. So I'm like, yay. So I remember buying um, the X-Men when you know Chris Claremont, I think, was writing it. And Gambit was first out. And it's like amazing. And I bring this book home. And I read this thing. And there's a word. The X-Men were waiting around in the night and it was to me and my X-Men because there's trouble and they're all wearing lingerie. That was the first time I saw ladies in lingerie too. I'm like, ooh, this is so weird. Yeah. Then my then my grandmother found that book because I'm living with them and they immediately tore those books up and said I'm not to bring those things in the house anymore. Look at these naked people. Oh my God, what is this? You, we have to go to church. This woman never walked to the church. She just sent me to church with my great grandmother. Made me have to go back and confess what I had done, that I brought these horrible sexualized things. So then comics shut down for me again until I came to New York. Now this is where I'm answering your question. So you went from this, my childhood, not being able to have these books. You know, I'm 12 years old, 13 years old. I cannot absorb this knowledge. Here, now it's deliberate. I'm deliberately going to defy this family who literally says, well, then you're on your own. Pack your duffel bag and a guitar, move to New York, and try to find my way into this neck of this world that I saw and learn very quickly, girls don't draw comics. That's what I was told. And I'm like, well, you know what? We'll see about that because this is what I know I'm supposed to do. But all of a sudden, now you've got the, the break happened. You've got Image Comics. They're they're huge. You've got Wildcats. It's on TV. You got the X Men. You know, with the '97 picking up and all. So all of this. This is my time. Yeah, I, I haven't I, watched. No, it no, yet. no. I'd forgotten about the Wildcats TV show. I yeah, forgot I about that cartoon. That. I haven't thought about that cartoon, and I don't know how. I remember watching it back in the day, but I was like, oh yeah, 
There was a wildcat. Sorry, you just made my brain have a serious flashback. You have no idea. <laughs> well, that's what that was like. Literally, so I'm watching wildcats, and then you have you, Joe Matarara. You've got all of these bigger artists. They're breaking away from Marvel. They're coming. You have you know you have Spawn. So now I can go to a comic book store because I'm in New York, and I'm you know you're an adult, and you can buy your own comics. And it was no longer just whatever the 7-Eleven had on selection. They've got this massive selection and what they're pushing. So then you had books like Danger Girl out. And that's when I first saw the variant cover phenomenon. It was coming in not through Marvel and DC so much because they would have the occasional foil cover. But it was coming in from these independent comics that were literally putting out 12 different comic book covers. And people standing there buying the 12 different comic book covers, whatever, how many, seven different variants, this or that and the other. And Danger Girl is flying off the shelf. And then you have Joe Matarara putting out Battle Chasers. And it's really getting like this ball rolling and less people interested in the story. They can't quote the story to you, but they've got all these beautiful covers. And now comic book coverage, it's only available this one month at this cover price. And then you go back the next week or two, and that thing is like 10, 20 times more. Literally, it shoots up. And I'm going, okay, so the market has done a dramatic change. When I was a kid, the book was $1.75. Now this book, I've got to have $20 to even buy because of a cover. And that sort of just kind of stuck. And then it went from 20 to 100 to all this. And then you've got to keep it pristine. So you know what most of my comics look like even today after they've been on the bathroom floor? At least I now put up this little thing on the back of my bathroom door so I could keep them in so I can have my reading material. Yes. But other than that, they would be on the floor. I, I, I need that. I want to point out whatever that. Do you can you send me and tell me what you use you put on your bathroom door to where it's all just because I need something like that but that's a whole other point altogether. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's funny because you bring that up, man. And now, and now you look, they've got these, you know, one in twenty five, one in hundred incentives where the the time, right when it comes out, it's twenty, thirty, forty, fifty bucks for that cover on the yeah. day of its release, which. That, that to me, it just makes me do this. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I don't, I but don't. That's exactly when I noticed it happening. I was like, I, Danger Girl, that kind of set. That's when I noticed it happening. Those comic books sort of brought in that era of, you know, where, and I, they, and also I missed the comics renaissance because while I was busy growing up. People were making $1,000 a page and some really serious money drawing comics. So that was like when he had that bloom. And then so when I come in, we're at the bust when Marvel's going bankrupt. And you're, you know, and paid, yeah, that they're going through their seven bankruptcies. And the crossover events are happening. Like, um, this was just before Marvel Knights was founded. Uh, so uh, I'm Ghost Posada's ghost. And I've been working with him since Osriel Ash. So when they did the Osriel Ash crossover with DC Comics, then I was ghost thinking um, Aquaman at that time, too. And all of a sudden, he's got this, they're going in Joe and Jimmy an adventure with Marvel called Marvel Knights. And that's where you get to see how the bacon, you know, I was really fried, How what's really going on, because now we're in an office setting. Most artists work from home. But at that time, Marvel Knights had the penthouse. So we're working upper floors of Marvel until they rolled into their what their eighth bankruptcy at that point because i remember they were in the midst of seven between seven and eight and then they moved marvel knights down to the main floor of marvel at that time so we were now absorbed into the last of the bullpen and being able to go to work every day in the bullpen first i was on the secretary pool side and then it's like we don't even want her over here because i kind of had a uh, a thing for scaring people with small things that look like um Taxidermy animals. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, my mom lives in Honduras. She would bring these little stuffed things like frogs. She brought me this massive lizard that was bigger than my cat. And he was all perched up like this, too, with the tail in the air. So I would bring that into Marvel and, you know, tie a string around his neck and put him down the hallway. I had security looking for a monitor lizard. It was great. And once they realized Seinfeld's girlfriend used to work there for not doing nothing. And they're like, people sort of resented that happening. Oh, I got rid of her. They 
put that big lizard down the hallway. People are going to stay in there. So, yeah, I would put, like, you know, freeze dry. Those go to Chinatown. You get those little seahorses that are whole, and you put them in a bag, and you tell people to touch it. You know, you're taking advantage of men, particularly because I put it in a Victoria's Secret bag. It says, here, see what I've got. So they learned very quickly, if Alita's bringing you a bag, it's probably got a dead animal in it to touch. Uh-huh. So you have to switch it up on them and put some nice things once in a while. I miss working in Marvel. Um, Is Hygen <laughs> just so you could torture everyone? Yes. That was my fun. I love that. Just the look on their faces. There was a come on, the first time. That's amazing. They're like, ooh, she's gonna show us lingerie. Ah! It's like <laughs> At least I know if we lucky. ever if we ever meet at a con and you're like, hey, reach in here, see what I got. I'll be like, yeah, and I'll just totally be like, all right, what is this? <laughs> It's the ones who that I could actually tell the ones who grew up with mischievous siblings versus the ones who were only kids or growing <laughs> up with kids too much of an age gap because the ones that were alone invariably fell for it. The ones that were, you know, yeah, I've had, I've, I know what you are. Yeah, let <laughs> let me let me look first. And say, oh God, why? <laughs> you know, they would look first, but then after a while, some people just wanted the thrill. That's why I had to go and switch over to the string around the neck and pulling it down the hall quickly. That was the best day I ever had in Marvel. I miss that kind of stuff. Now the bullpen is, especially after COVID, you go up there and it's like office. The fun, that rolling, that kind of thing that used to exist is long gone. That is long gone. It went away. Basically, the, the day the towers went down, that was the end of that for everybody. So... It was very interesting to see how this this quickly, rapidly evolving field of comics and what they try to do to keep bringing in readership. And they keep catering to the older readers or the collectors because they're going to spend money on all those variant covers. I will pick the one I like the best. And if it's like reasonably priced, I will buy it if they don't give it to me in the set of comps. And I think I want to keep it. But I keep very few comics. But it seems to be driven toward... The existing, the market is driven toward the existing, you know, absorbers of comics, the collectors who are buying it because they're the ones wielding the money and less concerned with new readership. Now they're trying to become more concerned with new readership. You need new people to pick up these books. But the pressure, the pushback, how do we instantaneously create a popular character? The answer to that is you don't. It has to grow over time. And, and you know, you make a valid point. And, and I think it's something even that's affected the ability of comics to be transferred over to other mediums. Because I think so many people, specifically when they're trying to create streaming shows now, everyone's looking for that next Walking Dead. You know? They're trying to pluck that next Walking Dead just write out of comic books and throw it up and have that first season get ridiculous numbers when they're just throwing up the whole season at first and then never making anything else for it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's a problem. This is something, do you think that an issue within that is the fact that they're all getting dropped at once as opposed to with the walking dead, it was dropped episode per week and everybody was talking about it. But most of these shows to get dropped from Paper Girls, uh, Deadliest Class. I mean, there's been a thousand others I just can't think of off the top of my head. Those are just the two. They got one season and just chopped. Uh, they were dropped all at once. Do you think that affects the ability of comics to get in other markets at a greater degree? Well, let, let's look at Invincible. I love, I read the, did you read the original Invincible? I read that. I loved it. I have loved not it read it. I have not read all of it, but everything I've read was was great. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. And now it's on now it's on Amazon, but at they're doing that one episode at a time. But this last season, the second season now, they cut in half. Again, it could have been the stride if I don't know what affected it to make it happen that way. But because it was on a hiatus for so long, my interest isn't the same level as it was when it was coming out regularly. 
And I, I'm one of those that don't have a lot of time. So I kind of prefer if they drop the whole thing in my lap and let me watch it at my leisure. If I love it, I'm going to binge it through like Blue White Samurai. Love that. I watched it. It was enjoyable. Then um, Oki, I watched that too. But then the ones that you're making me come back, I'm not going to remember it next week or I might be too busy. And then I'm going to let them pile up and then I'll watch them all when they finally come out. But if you put the book on or put the show on hiatus for a while and give me it's now missing months, I'm going to return reluctantly to it. It's not going to really be there for me to go, oh, I'm very happy to go see this. Or when it comes up, I'm going, yeah, that's probably like, I don't know if you've noticed now, Netflix will rotate things to the top of your pile, but they don't have a new season. So you're there trying to, you're like, oh, something new came out. Like when Amazon rotates, rotates it to the top and it's not, it's like preparing you for the new season coming. So you might as well watch the old one again. I'm like, don't do that to me. It's too much of you're guiding me to what I should like or what I need to watch like Marvel in order to enjoy the next movie. Whereas that they would usually tell you that is the mark of a poorly told story that it needs to rely on another story to make it complete. I mean, I mean, yeah, I think I think there are truths and falsities in that statement, you know, because I think some of the greatest stories, um, they're they're longer stories, you know what I mean? I mean, from you could look at uh, I'm going to throw out some things that funnily enough, I would not say I'm a real big fan of, but they're very, very much like this, like the Lord of the Rings, the Star Wars films, Um Star Trek never had that problem, funnily enough. I think Star Trek, you could pretty much just jump in and watch anything, and you didn't... Except know. Discovery. Uh, That's the okay. only one of the things I haven't finished, because it's literally suffering from that from the new style of storytelling, whereas we've got one minute to get through this place, but now we're going to have this break in the middle of this adventure to talk about mel- mental health concerns. Yes. And then, but then we have a minute. So they literally, they'll start you off with this wonderful big problem. You have to watch every episode to get to it. So they're not giving you short bursts like Strange New Worlds, which is amazing. I love that one so much. No, you give me this thing and then we go off on tangents in different directions. And then you cram the whole point of it together in the last episode or episode and a half. I don't care. You're literally... You don't believe in your drama. You're trying to send me a message so that you think that I don't want to read the action. I only want to read, well, who's this character kissing this week? I don't care. I don't want soap operas. I literally want to see a space drama. I want to see them going after, you know, meeting new people, getting involved in stuff. Not this, we need to take this break now to stay inside here and discuss our personal problems endlessly for an hour. Oh, by the way, we're all supposed to be hunting for whatever it is to save the universe. But we do that, you know. Imagine if Ripley <laughs> at one point just would have been like in the middle of all of that, like in the first Alien films, I have to go have an emotional breakdown real quick. Okay, you're dead. It wasn't even, I can understand if she had had a little, I've got to have a moment for that. But no, I'm going to literally go off on a tangent yeah, now. Let me true. go and call my daughter at home. And I just want to check on you and Make sure you're doing okay. I know it's been a while. I haven't seen you. <laughs> no, oh, the monster at the door. It, it'll wait. It'll wait. It'll wait. I just <laughs> want to make sure it'll... that we handle it. And let me have a conversation about being a woman in space all by myself here. Because the other women are dead. She, quite frankly, she should have listened to me. She wouldn't have been dead. The monster's still at the door while I'm saying all this stuff, by the way. <laughs> but let's take a moment to recap. And then in the last five minutes, she defeats the monster. Yes. I'm just envisioning how bad that film would have been. Aletha, I'm really glad, yeah, that it's not that story, because that would bloody well suck. Um, Like, terribly, and I wouldn't be a fan. Uh, Oh, my gosh. Do you you think that's a problem in modern storytelling, then? The fact that (laughs) we're more worried about representing people's emotions as opposed to telling the story. Not that emotions are not a large part of the story, but that we're we're trying to be therapists with entertainment. There you go. That's a way to put it. 
Well, it is. And it's like, we do love the emotional connections that between the characters, we like to see the connect, like the ability of them to joke and communicate with each other. We like the relationship between like Mr. Spock and Captain Kirk and calling, you know, Bones and then finding out why he gave him that, why they have that nickname. All these things are wonderful together. But if it's the sole focus above the story or the reason why we're here, then you've lost the point of us being here. And it doesn't hold your attention. It's not as easy to like, I'm going to sit here and invest all this time in this, especially if you're going to tell me. Look! <laughs> the wife's getting home. The dog is angry. Yeah. Oh. Look, I'm going to knock you out, dog. I'm not going to really knock my dog out, but I'll tell her I'm going to knock her out. Yeah. Yes. It's like she wants cut. something and she wants you to get it for her now. Yeah, I mean, well, whatever. All right. Lace that back in and I'll cut it at a point and I'll cut it at a point and it'll all look good. I promise. I hate it. I'm, I'm sure. I understand. I, I'm surprised here stays quiet this long as if they, they're sort of used to it, but they have a time limit. They know like, okay, it should be now. All right, now. Now we're just going to start appearing or scratching at my leg. But so far they're like, I'm just going to lay here and stay out of frame for the most part, but just you wait. I'm honestly too trying to wait for my computer to finish updating. So um, I can at least do the end bit with the questionnaire that I normally do, but I'm, okay. I don't think I'm going to be able to because it's being a, um, 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 I, I'll hit my technology. Question. I pulled up, I have it pulled up on my screen. So if you want me to read the question out to you and then we could go down the list that way, because I have the full list in front of me. I always pull it because I will never remember what I said, especially when I'm tired. But it's really weird. You know, that's a thing we Somebody, who was it, um, Dan Jolly, put out this little snippet of, of something he wrote about, say, answering questions about well, why can't, why does a character have to be, you know, black? Or why does a character have to be gay? Or why does, and then always the answer was they don't have to be. It's what the creator wants them to be. But to me, I don't care what the character is. I want to see an arrange assortment of people working together to solve a problem. I do not want to see an assortment of people complaining about their problems and not sorting out the problem that I came here to read about. In fact, I don't like that bait and switch that I've noticed in some books now where they'll give me this wonderful pitch and then the book did not focus on anything to do with that. We're going to have a war with the dragons and Oberon and there is no war. So you've read this whole thing and nothing is there for you to absorb about this war that they should be having. It's very interesting that now in this quest that they think, this is why I don't watch Stranger, like Strange Tales, Stranger Tales, that one, I don't watch that one at all because I saw where it went, where people got upset. So you have monsters, horror, things that are terrible. Your cast is relatively diverse, but then you divide them so that all of the white people can go properly focus on the monster and the, the epic, but the black people's biggest fear are the white people. So really? So the monster, I'm going to, I'm okay. The monster won't kill me. He's going to, you know, I've got to worry about this same asshat who literally tormented me from the very first show. When you have stuff like that, that you're telling me that I am not a part of this tale telling, that I don't have reactions that would be normal to being attacked. My greatest fear is you. That's not, it's like, wow, how could you, it's an almost an insult to me as a human walking around on this planet that you cannot, that the moment you think of me, you think of me in your own terms of whatever it is that you think of. You, I don't have agency of my own. I see that in interviews I do. I see that in a lot of stuff where people literally make you justify why you're in this space or why you like this thing. Like you shouldn't like it. I did one about horror. Oh, you like horror? Why wouldn't I? Why do I have to justify my like of horror? I just, you know, all I know is, and I unfortunately ain't going to be able to get through your question at any degree that I would and it's fine. I've got a plan for the end to wrap it up perfect. It's going to work. But there are a point I want to make that I loved and, and we've got to get into one final thing before we wrap this up. But, but man, I'm getting a lot to edit as it is. So I want to point out when you said sci-fi and horror and then you didn't list aliens or alien somewhere, 
part of my part of me was like, mm. but in the bulk of this conversation, I thought that was a given. Yeah, I, I mean, I look. That's <laughs> that's the thing. When you say you're into sci-fi and horror, if somebody's told me they love those two genre of films, and you know, were of an older age, you know, I mean, if it's some kid and they like, if it's some eighteen-year-old and they say that and they've never heard of Alien, fine. I'm like, dude, go watch this movie, right? But yeah, because it is. I, the only thing, I mean, I can't think of a greater sci-fi horror film, except maybe, um, oh, am I really just going to space the name of that film? Um, I'm trying to pull it in from over here into my brain. I really am. Yeah. I, I know it. Uh, the, the spaceship, and it's like they ostensibly summon hell by going through a different dimension. And, oh, uh, Event Horizon. Yes, Event yes. Horizon. Love Those, Event Horizon. Two greatest sci-fi horror films. I, I, I don't know that I can put another... And yeah. I don't even count Alien as a horror film. That is true, pure sci-fi. It is literally... They didn't... If you got scared from it, well, that's on you. And quite frankly, the cat's the only survivor. Let everyone know. Cat was smart. Cat figured it out. It's like, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm the only survivor here, and I know how I'm going to do it. But, yeah, but Event Horizon was pure horror. Horror, space horror, wonderful story. Loved it. Why do you not call Alien a horror film? Because it had all of the aspects for for serious science fiction. You didn't show me the monster. You let that tension build and build and build. The monster wasn't for shock value. It is now, I'm going to now think about how I'm going to defeat this thing. And one by one get picked off. There were moments where you have, imagine you were just taking the, the, the Star Trek model and just upping our ante a little bit more, but they were constantly trying to think their way through this problem. You didn't just have muscle people just going in. Think about what the, the thought process was. I can't let you in this ship. It's against protocol. Let me in. You've got people going, no, this person is hurt. I, I'm going to over. And then at the end of the day, think about it. If Bishop did not do what he did, that would have been a short movie. And Ripley would have been right. Wait, you mean you mean Ash? Yes, Ash. That's right. So because he's not fish this way. Uh, yeah, but yeah, Ash, yeah. No, that was that was the that was the android that was way, 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 way. Yeah. Way so you saw way, this. Way. They, so there were things going on there. So it wasn't just the normal horror thing. Would be, I don't know what's going on in this world. I've never seen a ghost or a monster before, and now I'm confronted with this thing, and I'm gonna run and run and run until it eats me. Usually that's what happens. You get killed. Many people die, and I get away somehow, and hopefully it's not following me home to come and get me again. It wasn't going in like that. We went in with a question of science first, with a question of protocol first, with discovery first, and the discovery went horribly awry. They didn't want to just... <laughs> You know, developing this monster. <laughs> Aliens is a space horror. Now we're going into bringing in the colonial marines and we're going to fight and fuss and run around and shoot them up and their blood going la 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 la. And then we all get away. And then Aliens 3, which I love Aliens 3. I know people don't like that one. That's one of my favorite. The score alone, that the score was so beautiful. I could bring tears to my eyes. It felt like being in a sea. I put on a surround sound. Oh my God. You could just feel that music. It was so good. I but had I love Yeah, I at a point had the soundtrack to all three of those films. So yeah, I completely and and yeah, thinking about it, Alien Three probably did have the best score between all three of them, man. It's funny though, you really you don't hear that as far as that being someone's favorite very often whatsoever um i'm not lying about one part that'd be pretty dope right but right i'm it's so funny in your questionnaire you asked about stuff like my favorite music well, i love heavy metal just and, to and i to know it. you hurt me you hurt my feelings on the kind that annoys you a little bit i won't lie i know because I, I remember last week you said about you know you being in, involved with that world and like that's great I, look but look I, firstly if you if you and you can go check it on the Patreon, there's the seven day free trial for anybody who wants to check it out. Uh, Vlad actually interviewed me for the unofficial last episode of season one. The official last episode is Alfonso. Oh. The unofficial last episode is Vlad asked me to do something I said I'd never do, which is fill out the questionnaire and then be interviewed by him. 
And I, I get into that whole community. I still I, I still make hip hop. My brother DKB's got an album coming out here shortly that I've got. I'm on like four tracks. We're working on another Killer Factor album. We, you know, we make music. But as far as the hip hop, we look. If y'all want to hear my opinion on all that and why I don't interview hip hop artists anymore, why I interview comic book creators, go sign up for a seven day free trial and and listen to that particular thing. But but. Yeah, I way prefer dealing with comic book creators than I do hip hop artists as far as in an interview stance and doing everything that I'm doing in the capacity of running this show. And I mean, I've ran several different shows as well as the radio for three years and got into all that. So, so it just, it just hurt my feelings personally. Cause I'm like, man, I make hip hop. But that's like one of those, like when I die and go to hell and purgatory, cause you know, we have to sit that they're going to play rap and hip hop music as my punishment. <laughs> they will they're gonna just stream it like elevator music and i'm like oh god you've got me every pen please every pen please stop uh, if, if they did that to me <laughs> yeah it really it really would not work that well whatsoever i want to point out it would be a it would be a bad option for them to take um but yeah but okay but besides that what i want to get into is that man i i know oh. See, I wanted to have it pulled up for me so I didn't screw up the name because I want to say it's it's. What's the name of the comic you're doing right now? I totally read it not that even long ago, but or at least the. Oh, for my own stuff, I was mentioning foreign. That's my foreign, own baby. Foreign. Oh my god. It's like in between, in like like from my work with DC, like foreign is a is a sci-fi. It's not actually comics. The pages I sent you from it, those pages are within the prose book. So you get prose, and then sometimes it breaks into full comic book pages. So it's a combination of the two. That's interesting. The only time I've ever heard of anyone doing that is Alex Segura, uh, who you can check on a past quest in season one uh, with a book that he recently wrote. What made you decide to do that that way? Because yeah, I've only ever heard of that twice. Because, you know, I've lived with this story my whole life. This is something I've written since I was a little girl. Literally before, like, foreign is actually a part of another larger universe that I've literally been writing in. I draw the characters from it. I've known it a long time. The reason this part was extrapolated and turned into its own story is because my son saw me doing it one day and noticed I was doing this thing and it was separate from my work and he started to ask me about it and he liked the characters but as he said he said mama you should do this and he was much younger than he is now and I said no this is this is actually personal work it's I don't want it to be like turn into what comics he said no no you should do this but begin at the beginning don't do a Star Wars he had just recently learned, I've shown him the Star Wars films, and he did not like the fact that one, two, and three really are four, five, and six. So you got to watch four, five, and six. So he said, well, why didn't they just make that before one, two, and three? Say, well, you see, they didn't know at the time. Those explanations are lost on children. They're looking like, this is just stupid. Just tell me the story in order. So he told his advice to me was, don't do a Star Wars. Tell, begin at the beginning of the story. So I took it to the beginning of Foreign. And sometime, for a long time, these characters, most of them were not from the other portion of the book. So I didn't know what they looked like. I knew their world was very much more, you know, colorful and diverse in that sense. Things that the Earth lost, the Earth and my story lost. So these characters, they, their life story is etched on their skin in the form of tattoos. They don't tattoo because it's art. They tattoo and every tattoo has a meaning. Every tattoo ties them. They introduce one to one another by shaking hands and looking at the tattoos written on their hands to get an overview of the person. Hmm. Other than that, they normally keep it covered up. So if you only write that down, and just like I've said it to you, you're not watching that. You're not able to see it. So I wanted to put pictures in, since I draw, into the comic book so that you can make comic book format in there. So some of this stuff is visual for you. So that if I show you a character and they're shirtless, they're probably never. In fact, one of the characters that you see shirtless at first, he definitely says that he only his wife sees his tattoos and never sees their back. So you see them so that you can see who they're affiliated with. You can read their tattoos over time and go, oh... I see what's important to you. I know who your children are. 
I know where you served, if you've served time, if you've been disciplined, because it's very much I love Again, my great love of sci-fi, now we're getting into Halo and other stuff like that, and I love military fiction. I will read everything from anything. Being a kid, reading military fiction all the way up till now, I love it. Love it to death. So I write in a military fashion in this world. So I wanted you to be able to look at these characters and be able to read these characters as well, not just in their prose form, but read what's written on their bodies. All right. Now, is that currently available? Yes, it is. We sell it at cons. And we're up to issue seven. What I sent you um, is from issue five. That's where we get into one of the biggest space battles, the early space battles there. And, oh, my goodness, yes, I love ships that fly in space. Love it to death. You know, one of your questions was anime. Hey, Robotech was the first thing I saw that was visual for me because remember you're reading military fiction people die in it all the time here you have a world where you know thundercats were great but they didn't change their clothes and nobody died here you have a here, here you have something where the characters you can love them and you lost two back to back poor ben didn't get to finish his steak and he was dead you have things where you have characters that are like so much more full and you realize okay you don't have to reset the world every time so even though i started off with things like spider-man and x-men and we know the characters just go into a pokeball for a while and come back out they're alive again here the character is gone forever and they're not coming back and there's no apology i notice as they try to write the modern tales they bring characters back to life it's like then you're not respecting or you're not understanding you just know that it hurt when Roy Folker died, and now you want him back to life, so I'm going to write him alive. It's like, but the point, you're missing the point of the character's arc then. And I did like the changes that the Americans made to it more so than when I finally saw him across, you know, the original. And some of these characters were absolute dicks and unlikable, so they didn't have that arc that, like, here we have this wonderful hero. We're seeing him. He's he's so personable. He's actually educating. He's not, and then he's dead. Something about that was more realistic and just more stuck with me than I'm an arrogant asshole and blah blah blah. And now I blow up. It's like, well, good. I'm glad you're dead. I was not glad this character is dead. And that's one thing I think is for everyone. We were not glad when these characters died because they were so full. And that's what we sort of lack in our modern storytelling. You don't make me care about these characters enough to care if they ever die. Yeah, and I and I think that like, if you don't establish that, then it's terrible. It's like I, I mean, if you to go back to Game of Thrones when they behead um, old boy at the end of the first book or the first season, however you consumed it, everybody was like, "What?" You know, like nobody expected that death um, mm -hmm. because they made you like in the thousand pages or however many episodes it was, um, it made you really care. And I think people were like, well, maybe they won't care and kill him, even though Sean Bean dies in everything he's in. Like, it's just... Yes, yeah. it became a joke. Look, this one, Lord of the Rings, <laughs> dead. First yeah. one. This one, he's dead here, dead here. It's like, look, <laughs> this dude, if he goes and he gets a role, you know the one thing about that character that's going to happen? It's going to die. <laughs> yep. It's just he just they're telling you the movie right now. Oh no, it's Sean Bean. Oh no, this character's dead before the end. For sure. <laughs> like, well, well, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really, really crazy reputation to have as far as for being an actor, right? But I'm very curious to see more of that. And it's interesting to know that you wrote it a little half and half. Because like I said, there's only one of the time that I've ever, ever ran across that, which is yeah, but you, you print it out as a comic book form, though? No, we print it out in, um, it's a half-sized novel, so it's like usually there's some okay. one hanging around here somewhere, so, yeah. So. Ah, uh, okay. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. That reminds me of the Vampire Hunter D book that I had back in the day. So actually, I printed them. We we were printing them at home entirely, but the recent ones I've sent out to a printer because we're getting overwhelmed, and we're also getting a lot of them now. So even though book five is the one we're pushing, the one that you see, we're actually up to book seven in print. So book seven is about to come out, and then we're going to prep eight. The first arc 
it's really supposed to be three com three books, but I broke it up into 16 individual novelists because people don't like novellas because people, you know, as when I try to put it, like, oh, it's they look at it's it's words. Yes, it's prose. Oh, it's so much to read. So I found that if you're, you'll probably be willing to read 120 to 200 pages. Yeah, like even this big one is 178 pages, but most of it's art. So you get a lot of art in there. So it's like, yeah, short chapters. But when I, if I ever find a publisher to carry this book for me, or if we ever just decide, you know what, let me take the Valor and go for it. I'm going to combine it back into its large format. Is there like no four, way that people can pick that up from you? Like, is there an online site people can pick that up from if they wanted to get it from you? You can buy issue one and issue two cheap if, as in a PDF from my website, www.ariotstorm.com. A R I O T S T O R M.com. Link in the descriptions right down there. Um, but, but they can't buy a physical copy. I want, like, you can buy them for me at conventions. This is the thing. At um, I always print them for cons. I make sure we have them because it's one of our good sellers. But if you talk about comic books as a difficult world to navigate through, I remember you had your pan con. You talked with women on there. You were being you you were really honing in. And I do hope that you bring on other creators that during their time when it's you know their books and stuff are coming out, not just Black history or women's history or stuff. You want to talk about a world that is like. Wow, gatekeepers, not hip hop, not comics, talk about people who write novels. When you're talking about the sci fi market, I have heard my name is too flowery and ethnic for publication. I have heard that, yeah, they don't, I try to go in and I don't go in. My name is Aletha Martinez and here's what I've done. No, no, I go in clean so people could take in, even I might not even tell you, especially if I'm putting my book in for beta reading, it's just A. AM or something. So you don't marry me to the comic book world. But divorce from comics, just going in as I am, I remember someone said, what are we going to, they someone wrote in like the marginal comic, we're going to read Tortillas in Space. I'm like, oh, so they're looking at your last name and saying cruel things. Well, you know, have you really, have we really ever heard, maybe you should drop the EZ from the end of your name and just go with Martin. Because while they do have women of color who write sci-fi, they don't have Hispanic women, people writing this stuff. It'd be hard to take it. So, so they're apprehensive to even read this book to give it a chance because they cannot get past what I'm packaged in or my last name in general. It's just not that market. They think I'm going to write tortillas in space. Like, really? Well, well firstly, firstly, Done properly, I think Tortillas in Space could be like a great addition to the Hitchhiker's Guide Galaxy World. All right, exactly. I want to point that out. So, for anybody that's got a problem with that, you take it and shove it. All right, all right, that's that's my whole opinion. All right, secondly, that's just so weird because, like, I now you're making me want to write something that's like this is Tortillas in Space because I think it's a freaking hilarious concept. Like, now I want to take that and spin that into something. Can I do that out of curiosity? You're not going to get mad at me, are you? Yeah, so you take, like, the harshest criticism I've gotten of Tortillas in Space and write a whole thing. And I think it would actually sell because of what you're packaged in. What I am packaged in, they don't even understand. Like, so my family is not from this country. I'm one of the first born in this country. So we don't have the slave narrative as our background. So they don't understand what I'd be writing about. So like, so what are you actually writing about? I'm like, uh, What? Look, what have you read? Have you read God Hates Astronauts? No, what's that? You haven't read God Hates Astronauts? No, I haven't. What is that? I need it, to know now. It's... I'm going to put this in here. <laughs> Crossover. Oh, wait. No, man. All right. Because uh, I don't want to get it wrong. Yeah. Ryan Brown. Yeah, let me see. Right? It's it's ludicrousy. That's it's 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 oh, it yeah, is, no no. Huh? That one. Yeah. No, I haven't read that one. This book is ludicrous. <laughs> okay. 
And I bring it up because if look, if I was gonna go about writing some about tortillas in space, it would probably be this ludicrous. Right? To where it's just like out there. Cause because like, yeah, the the first story might be tortillas in space, but then you'll have like hamburgers in Saturn or in around Saturn and then like, you know, hot dogs bordering the sun. And then like, like I would take it as absurd as I possibly could. Because I don't like I I think because I think you could make a really funny book that way, personally. Like, I think it could be a, a great play on a lot of different there, things, you know? Um, in sci-fi for that Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you have a lot of things where, when they're talking about this is serious science fiction, they're almost like, what kind of, they're, again, coming back to that question, well, why are you here and what kind of voice could you possibly lend to this? We don't need, a, they're already pushing back on me adding a lens, and I hate to use the W word because that's what they think they're going to hear. You know the word. That it's like, this is going to be something she's writing with a chip on her shoulder. It's like, read the thing. It's Star Trek with cursing. There's, yes, you've got things, I'm going to challenge you to, you, when you realize what the earth was left with and these and why the, the real conflict of the book is that people of earth consider themselves fully human. But you have these humans who've been in space for hundreds of years now wanting to return to the planet, but they're returning as an advanced multicultural, multi-species race. And they're coming to the earth trying, they've been protecting the earth from everyone else for a long time. They're a massive army and you've got this push back against this military society who only wants to be your friend. But, so you give them rules. Some of them break them. You follow Steven Sunderval. He breaks a major rule and loses his humanity. Remember, he's only a human too anyway. So you're already less than human to them. So fine, he gives up the humanity. It means nothing to him in that sense. And you're watching him go through this transformation for 147 days while this whole space epic is starting, this, this tension between the earth is what they want to do, bringing back elections. They want to rule their planet. Their humans no longer even govern their own planet. They want the UEDF to help them with that. I am so much more intrigued by this stuff. Like, he, he just got me like, okay, I got to get this in there. Every time I bring on a guest, they just like want to affect my wallet. That's what they all do. You guys come in here to sell, which, which technically I hope for everyone out there watching, I, I hope you think the same as I do, because this, <laughs> that, that sounds very, very fascinating on a number of things. I, and it really, truly does. And for everyone out there, like I said, there's a link in the description to where you can get right to it real quick. So you can check it out for yourself or find her out at a convention and, you know, get you some of them hard copies. Um, but this is, Here, because, this to is, do a recap book. Yeah. skip over one to four to five so people could go read the recap pick up book five read the cliff notes pick up book five and dive right in but it's funny in interviews this is the most i've ever spoken about foreign story they don't let me speak about this thing at all it is that proving you need to be here the agency the whole nine yards your comic book artist are you gonna stop drawing no it's like you don't, it's not an either or prospect. I write every day and I draw every day. I work on foreign every day. I work for other people every single day. This is my entire life is this living in this world. This is what I do. I take care of my kid and I draw and write. That's it. I'm not, I don't date. I don't do anything else. I don't, I go to movies. I literally absorb even more stuff so that you can continue to draw and write. It's everything. Imagine your whole life revolves around this. Since I was a kid, once I got direction, I know what I wanted. And that was it. People are like, well, that seems like a sad life. My life is extremely full. It's fun. It's inventive. I just hate that people cannot accept that this is what I want to do, and I might be good at doing it, at least give it a chance. I think the funnier thing is, is you're obviously someone that had a dream as far as to get to into doing something. You, you had this, you know, you wanted to do comics, you wanted to write, and you didn't let go of it. And the fact that you've become successful in it makes people, and I, and I think that's that's a lot of the cases with a lot of people. A lot of the people, they had something they wanted to do, and then they just, for some reason, at some point go and and walk away from whatever that was. And then there are people that 
do the exact opposite and they grip onto it and they and they do and they do and they do and for some reason for the people that are able to do that and then truly achieve what they want to at least a degree it makes other people look at them i think with jealousy that they will never admit so they twist it into some kind of other normally insult towards them you know and i i think that's a sad thing because i think in that we lose we lose so much i i think that is giving up a part of your humanity in my opinion when you do that so go to space right I mean, a couple of y'all are trying to get there anyways. Why don't you just go and stay? We all know who I'm talking about, right? But I'm going to be real honest on the note of my humanity. I got some Taco Bell sitting out here. I really, really want to get to. I really do hope that you've enjoyed your time over here at Quest. I would love to have you come back and draw sometime live. Yes, we'll see. You know, I've told you we're rotating into into the horror. to like, oh, no. Oh, but, yes, and thank you for having I, me. And I would mm, love to oh, return. you're making me want to, like, I got a pan con coming up that I want to be like, hey, look, dude, can I move you over here so I can put her over here? But I'd have to figure out if that date was good with you first before I even go about doing all that. But I may do that because, you know, it's a quest. And sometimes you got to be like, oh, wait, for this quest, I need the I need the elf. And I actually need the dwarf over here for this part because, you know, this part involves <laughs> this part involves archery and this part over here. I need somebody to craft something really crazy, you know, and that's just how exactly. things turn. And you need a proper dark elf like Elvig of Melniborn to carry a cursed sword that makes him totally evil. Yeah. That's the same. You know, <laughs> so this is, this is why it is the quest. And this is why it runs on sheer madness and probably that the fact that I'm the dude that you know is the main yeah whatever we ain't even gonna get into all that but as i said i hope you all have out there enjoyed it make sure you click the links in the descriptions uh, at least check out foreign that sounds i i'm so annoyed you didn't send me more now to be real honest not that i would have had the proper time to read it anyways but that's neither here nor there i got things to edit so you know we get to this episode before they announce what you got coming up at DC here soon that you won't tell me. But that's fun, right? It has probably been announced at this point, and I may like may like just drop an image right there of the cover of the book that she's working on right when I just said that. We don't know. We'll find out when I get to that point, right? That'd be amazing, yes. Yeah. But, <laughs> but besides that, right, for all y'all out there watching, I want to let you know if you've enjoyed this quest. What I want you to do is send a dragon with a whole bunch of money to one, buy a bunch of them books from her, right? All right? Just playing a heavy metal guitar, because, you know, why not, right? With some, um, what's, what's, what's the, what's the, what's the, where's the last one? See, I normally would have had, but my computer was a pain, and it just wasn't fun, and it's making this way more difficult than it should have been, right? With some bail? Bail? Hmm? B A O, what? Yeah, for food. That's those soup. Jap that's those um soup dumplings. The Chinese soup dumplings, the big ones. Ah. That you bite inside soup. So one of my favorite food. Is so so have the dragon just hand cook some of those right there, and then fly off and bring you your books. Right now, if you haven't enjoyed this interview, we don't know what to tell you. I mean, really, really, <laughs> typically, I would, apparently, she's afraid of no mythical creature because they're not real. That wasn't a fair answer, right? So, <laughs> and instead, what we're going to do, all right, because we got to figure out something. I do love you. For that, because they, did, they, they let me watch, like, weird, scary movies because they don't understand about them. So, I saw The Exorcist when I was so young that it desensitized me to everything. So, I can be startled in movies but it doesn't frighten me and there's nothing like, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. <laughs> See, there's a, so, so, no, there's a so no, so no, I got you. If you didn't like this interview and for some reason, I just annoyed you at some point. I hope she didn't. It's been a pleasure. It really has. I hope we see you more over here on the questionnaire. Um, but if, if she did, man, just shorten her deadline somehow, which, oh my God, that's so rude. Yes. Yeah, send, send, send a deadline reminder. So I could feel that horrible, horrible there's this weird like something grabbed your heart and squeezed it a little bit and you're like oh, oh yeah. i got a mini heart attack yeah. oh i said yeah. 
Yeah, so, so, so that'll do. <laughs> since since you didn't want to name a mythical creature, I'll give you something that's just terrifying in the real world. I'm sorry you should have answered the question. You didn't answer the question, but hey, that's beside the point. About it, it's like with your toys. It's like <laughs> I didn't really have them growing up. It's like, but oh, I oh, did oh, my oh. Thank you for saying that because I forgot. Also, if you did enjoy the interview with that dragon, what I'd like you to do is send her a bunch of the old school Kenner alien and predator toys, right? Because I'm abs <laughs> I'm absolutely positive she would enjoy just a just a big old just pile of the alien and predator toys from Kenner way back in like I think the nineties, right? So I had to throw that in. I'm glad you brought that up so I could throw that in bit in because they made some awesome toys at least. Matt, besides that, for all y'all out there, I only want you to do aha three things, right? One, hit that thumbs up. Two, get your Comic Con. Three, have a good night, y'all. This has been the questionnaire. Where where's the link? Thanks for checking out the questionnaire. In the link below, yes. I will drop it like it's hot. That's another party. It's cool, man. I love it. The questionnaire. That is all.